chapter 19, I'm going to go sing another song, and you can find your place there, John chapter number 19, and uh, we've got the Easter celebration coming up, and so I'll share with you something about missions at Calvary and out of John chapter 19. We'll sing one more song. <laughs> As the blind man was sitting there by the way, he cried to Jesus for mercy that day. Jesus commanded and gave him his sight. He followed Jesus, I'm sure he cried. Jesus passed by my way, and he made me whole that Just a sinner was I, but then Jesus passed by, and oh, what a change in my life when Jesus passed by. Now, just like of sin I was always alone then one day I met Jesus and he made things right and oh what a difference when Jesus passed by Jesus passed by chapter number 19, and I'll run real fast. I don't really have anything deep, just important, okay? John chapter 19 and verse number 25. John 19, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Okay, you got who's there? Who's there? Mary, Mary, and Mary, okay? Three ladies. And who else is there? Look at verse number 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved. Now who's that? John, the beloved. He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. So in this account of the, the crucifixion, we know that there's Jesus on the cross. And we know, know that there's at least three ladies. And we know that there's one man. Okay, that's all the knowledge that we have in this account of the story. Look at verse number twenty. Six, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and disciples standing by whom he loved, 
He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the privilege to be in the house of God today. Help us to get a hold of this very simple truth as you've laid it on our hearts so strongly today. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen and amen. Now, my question today is very simply, what is your Mary? What is your Mary? You say, what in the world do you mean by that? Well, John was there and the three ladies were there and Jesus told John, John, this is your mother. And Mary, this is your son. Now, what's interesting, this is kind of interesting to me, Jesus did have some half-brothers. Jesus had some other brothers. Why didn't Jesus relinquish the responsibility of taking care of his mother to his brother? Jesus was the oldest of the boys. Mary was not very old. Okay, if Mary was an older teenager when Jesus was born, maybe between 16 and 20 years old, that would put her at this time, she would be in her late 40s or early 50s when Jesus is on the cross. So she's not very old. What else? Where's Joseph? Why didn't Joseph take... I don't know what happened to Joseph. There's all kind of historical uh, uh, guesses as to what happened to Joseph, and I'm not, I don't have time to get into that. But I don't know where Joseph's at. All I know is that Mary needed to be taken care of. She was a weaker vessel, and she had uh, uh, things, maybe bills to pay. I don't know. Either way, John was given instructions to take care of the mother of Jesus. Now, I want to break from that for just a second and go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Turn there with me. We don't usually do a whole lot of turning, but turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, and I want to read one verse to you there. 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, and uh, this is very interesting to me. I'm going to bring this into a, a, a modern perspective, okay? 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, and look at verse number 13 and 14. We'll read two verses. The, the author here says, If I shut up heaven, this is, this is God speaking, If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. Now, this sounds like a very sim similar situation to the day that we're living in today. Wouldn't you guess? Oh, yeah, there's a bunch of pestilence going on. There's a bunch of things taking place in our land today, both physically and spiritually and everything else, economically, politically. I'm telling you what, if you have confidence in any political uh, environment in the United States of America, you're simply uneducated. Now, I'm not being ugly when I say that. Uh, you, uh, if you take five minutes and study the backgrounds of some of the people and the higher-ups of the United States, you'll find out that we don't have a whole lot to put confidence in. Can I get an amen from Brother Frank back there? Hey amen. He's with me on that. All right. You can't just trust everybody, right? Okay. I don't know that I could put confidence in ten of them out of the whole bunch. Okay. We're in a mess. Now, you don't fix that by, by you know, trying to come up with all kinds of ideas and programs. The way you fix that is you fix the spiritual problem, and the spiritual problem will fix everything else. We agree with that, right? Okay? Now, keep in mind, we've still got John and the three ladies and Jesus at Calvary. Okay? I'm going to bring this around to perspective. Okay? Now, he said there was problems, 2 Chronicles 7. If I bring the pestilence and all the... And we've got here earthquakes and divers places and wars and rumors of wars. It's just a bad situation we're living in today. He gives the cure. Okay, in verse number 14, and most of you could probably quote it. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear, heal their land. Now, first thing I'm going to do this morning is I'm going I'm to do two things real fast. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to expose the problem and then I'm going to administer the fix, okay? So we're going to expose the problem here using this passage. Then we're going to go back to our text in the book of John, and I'm going to give you the fix for it, okay? That's real super easy. I like simple stuff, okay? All right, so let's go back and expose the problem. In America, we don't want to admit there's a problem. I know the modern educational system, and some of you may be in that. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, they don't want to, a child to feel like he's wrong. Oh, well, 4 plus 4 is not 13. But Johnny has a good reason to put 13, so as long as he can explain his answer, it's okay. We were going down there, and, and, that's so, and it may not be in Madison County yet, but it's coming, okay, that kind of mentality, okay? It's coming. Oh, we don't want our children to learn cursive. 
Wonder why you don't want to learn cursive. I tell you why I don't want to learn cursive because the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and all the original documents in the United States of America were written in cursive. So if your children can't read it, oh, they don't know what it says, so the big ups can rewrite it. No, that's not going to happen. Okay, well, you just wait and see. I mean, it's, it's getting ugly in America, okay? My, we were going down the road the other day, and my boy said, my boy made this statement, my six-year-old, he said, um, yeah, I don't remember the number that he pulled out of nowhere, 76 or 73, whatever it was. He said, we've been in church 70-something years as a family. Something like that, some statement he made. And I did the math in my head real quick, and he had added up all of our ages, all five of us, mine, my wife, his sister, his brother, and his age, all in his head, and come up with a number that had been how long we'd all been in church. And he was right. He had added all the uh, numbers up in his head. He had got the problem right. Now, I could have, and, uh, and then he, he did it again. He said, wait a minute, I think I missed it by two. And he took Carson's age out, two years. He took it out and gave us a new number. Now, I could have said, well, whatever you want to say is okay. If you feel like it's that number, will you just express that? Yeah. The pilgrims came over here searching for gold. No, they didn't. They came over here to start a conservative Baptist church in, in Massachusetts, in Virginia, or whatever they started. Oh, they're, we got to separate church and state. Well, they're not doing that over there in Pakistan where a, a young man is going to be hung next week, executed in Pakistan, because he and his buddy had a land transaction that his friend got mad at him and went to the court and accused his friend, his Christian friend, of blasphemy against Muhammad. And so they're taking him, and just because he said something negative about Muhammad, they're going to execute him. Oh, let's be tolerant in America. Let's love everybody, but nobody else is going to do it. Okay? We're in an ugly situation. I don't think we have a problem identifying that. He gives a little list here. He said, if my people. I think the first reason that we're in an ugly situation in America is because most everybody ain't even saved. We can't expect to spiritualize the United States of America until we, until we evangelize the United States of America. We can't cure the problem until we give peop get people to Calvary. You understand? If my people, which are called by my name. Now that phrase puts the responsibility on the back of those that are connected to God. People in America that are trying to find a cure for our problems, a lot of them don't even have any spiritual spirituality at all, and if they do, it's some off-the-wall something or another. I made the dumb mistake yesterday. We were on our way to a youth meeting last night, and I thought, well, I'll just drive through Asheville because there was somewhere we had to stop on the way. I'll just drive up through Asheville. Well, it just happened to be right before the orange peel opened up. I hadn't been through that part of town in quite a while, and I was coming up that hill, you know, and they were lined up plumb all the way to the square to get into the orange peel. Now, number one, you got to have something. Something's not right up there if you want to line up to go to a place called the orange peel. And uh, that's that, that place because it's nothing but a bunch of junk. Oh, well, don't identify that as junk. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. You know, we have feelings ourselves into being dead spiritually. Dead spiritually. Now, if we call for a special singing tonight, like we're going to have, I wonder if they're going to be lined plumb all the way up to the square for that one. No, oh, no, we're not going to do that because that's just weird. What's wrong with the world we're living in today? If my people, which are called by my name, Christians aren't taking personal responsibility. Well, let's blame it on somebody else. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. Well, I'm going to go to church somewhere else because that preacher said something I didn't like. Well, John the Baptist didn't get his head chopped off for reading a poem. Jesus was 100% positive. Oh, no, he wasn't. I'm sorry. He said a lot of ugly stuff to a lot of people. He said some things that was negative. Okay? I heard a preacher one time in Henderson County, and he's just from the woods. He said, there ain't no way in the world you're going to get a car to crank if you don't have negative and positive, bless God. That's right. You may have a car, but it ain't going down the road unless you've got both of them cables hooked up. Hey, man! Is that right? You go ahead and take that negative cable off, and you're going to have trouble getting somewhere. Hey, man! Some of y'all are with me. Come on now, get in with me. If my people, which are called by my name, now here's the, 
Here's, here, okay, we've identified ourselves as God's people that need to fix the problem. We can't make, listen, Dr. Phil's not going to fix America. Oprah, even though she's moved on to bigger and better things, she's not going to fix America. Not going to do it. The White House can't fix America. The Capitol building can't fix America. It's, it's the responsibility of God's people. How does that work? Well, it starts on the nucleus of a church just like this, and you reach out to fix your community. It's not as though we're better than them. That's not what I'm saying. It's not like we don't need to be fixed ourselves. Okay? We reach them with the gospel. And as we reach them with the gospel, then the problems start solving themselves. What's the four problems with the children of God that are keeping us from curing our nation? The first one, humility. Shall humble themselves. Humility. We are so full of ourselves. You ever notice that? I, I get so tickled at people. I love looking at selfies. Now, some of y'all know what a selfie is. Some of y'all don't have a clue what I'm talking about. That's okay. You don't need to know. It's okay. I get tickled looking at them because, you know, everybody wants to pose this way or pose that way, and it's just wonderful. It's just wonderful to see. I see my friends, you know, they're taking selfies, and me and my wife took one together yesterday. What do you call a double selfie? What is that, a selfies? What is it? A dual selfie? I mean, they're, they're putting new words in the dictionary now thanks to modern technology. We've come up with all kind of stuff. You know, you don't even write the word thanks out anymore. It's THX. Why waste two letters? Respell it. Let's reinvent the whole thing. You don't even have to type out, I'm laughing right now. You type out LOL. I got so tickled at the preacher last night at the church we was at. He said he got a text message way back when texting first started. He got a text message from another preacher that said LOL, and he said the community that he was from, when you wrote LOL to somebody, that meant lots of love with a wink. <laughs> he looked at his wife and he said, Why in the world is brother so-and-so sending me a text message that says lots of love? <laughs> he said last night, he said, he said if that old boy had been sitting with him, he'd have done knocked him out. He would have done punched his lights out. And then he would have, would have asked for an explanation. What does LOL mean? Laugh out loud. LOL means ha, 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 ha. That's what it's supposed to mean. Okay? And you know what we do? It's all about self-promotion. Self-promotion. Make your way to the top here. Do this here. Do this here. Make yourself look good. And that's okay. I, I'm glad everybody's not ugly. Amen right there. But the world, it, the, 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 world, the world we're living in today is so full of pride. If you can't stamp out the pride, there's no way in the world we're going to cure America. We're full of ourselves. Humility. It's almost like, he, it's almost like the, the, the prophet Samuel and God were talking to America. Now, I had a preacher last week, last Monday. He made this statement. He said, 2 Chronicles chapter 7 is in the Old Testament, and we don't have any business applying that to the local church. That's what he said. And I'm talking about a conservative Baptist evangelist. He said, 2 Chronicles chapter 7 was not written to the local church, and we have no business trying to apply it. I don't agree with that. Do you? The Bible says all Scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God and is what? What's the first word? Profitable. Well, I can read this and I can profit from it. And it's telling me I need to be humble if I'm going to fix America. The second thing it says is that you've got to pray. We got the, we're in a, a prayerless society. They're trying to stomp out prayer left and right. They don't want you to pray. They don't want you to talk to God. And the devil has been very successful in making that happen. Humility, prayer. What else? Seeking God's face. This is where we actually follow Jesus. Seeking God's face means that we're going where he's going. Okay? Now, if, I, if I'm in, and we're not talking about Skype and FaceTime, we're talking about telephone calls, okay? If I am in Australia and I call my dad, 14,000 miles away, 16,000, whatever it is, I come and say, hey, dad, how are you doing? I am communicating with him. That's like prayer, okay? That's like prayer. If I call my wife on the phone and talk to her, hey, we're out here passing out gospel tracts. What you doing? You know, he's talking on the phone. I'm 14,000 miles away. If I call my son, and I'm talking to him on the phone, 14,000 miles away, I'm just communicating with him. That's like prayer. Let me tell you the difference between praying and seeking God's face. Seeking my son's face 
would be me getting on the airplane to come back to see him and finding him and being with him. And as God goes places, we go with him. That's what seeking God's face is. Well, where's God going? Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man has come, what? To seek and to save that which was lost. So if we're going after God, we're going after lost people. I think I could get enough deductive reasoning for you to believe that in the Bible. If we're going to be following God, He's going where lost people are, and if we're not going where lost people are to get them in, then we're not seeking His face. So to cure the problem in America, we need to get rid of our pride, we need to start praying, and then we need to go where God's going. Now let's look at the last one, and this is the obvious one. Turn from your wicked ways. This is the first thing we identify. Let's fix America. Let's get rid of all the bars. Is that going to fix America? Nope. Let's make pornography illegal. Will that fix America? No. Let's shut down all the abortion clinics, which is one of the best things that this country's ever started doing. I mean, they're shutting down left and right. Is that, that's a good thing. But is that going to fix America? No. I hope they shut them all down. But that's not going to fix America. Let's create this law. Will that fix America? No. Let's do this. Will that fix America? No. What's going to... It, turning from your wicked ways is a good thing, but it's the last in the list. And as a matter of fact, you'll automatically do that if you do the first three. Humility, prayer, seeking God's face, and you'll find yourself, when you're following God, you'll find yourself running away from wickedness. Now, we've identified the problem. Let's present the cure. Are you ready? Here we go. Back to John chapter number 19. Now, once you look at, at this very simple concept in John chapter number 19, the world in that day, was it any better of a world then than it is now? Well, technically, it's getting worse and worse. So back then, maybe it wasn't quite as bad. I don't know. It was still full of human beings that were wicked. So Jesus is passing out marching orders to everybody on how to reach the world, okay? And he gives very broad information. Five times we find in the Bible, really, really six, but at least five times we find in the first five books of the Bible Jesus giving orders for us to follow on how to reach the world of the gospel. Let's quote a few of them. Okay, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's a good one, right? Mark 16, 15. What did Matthew write down? He said, well, uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's an instruction on how to go out and reach the world. What about Acts chapter 1? Jesus himself speaking. He said, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be what? Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and, uh, and Churchill, Australia. The furthest point from right here. The uttermost part of the earth. Okay, so as we reach the world, as we're trying to reach out to the world, reach out to the world, Reach out to the world. Reach out to the world. We all know that we have something to do. Everybody in here, did you know that? Did you know that everybody in here, young, old, middle-aged, whatever you are, you got something to do. God's got something for you to do. I've been preaching this for years. I, people just think that it's just left up to the ordained ministers. My neighbors, God love them. I love my neighbors. The other day, woke up in the middle of the night, blue lights flashing, looked out the window, and there were five cruisers, police cruisers, in my neighbor's driveway. Now, you don't get five police cruisers for throwing a pot or a pan. You don't get five police cruisers for some small incident. So I got real nervous. The next day, I called a, the, a buddy of mine. He's a, a high-end detective in our county. And I called him up, and I said, this and this and this and this. What happened? He looked at me and he said, well, I don't know. I wasn't on call last night. But here's your number, somebody that wouldn't know. So I called that number. The lady got on the phone and she said, uh, I said, can you tell me what happened? She said, I'm sorry, I can't reveal that information. I said, you know, she said that to me. You know what I wanted to say? Woman, it was at my neighbor's house. I have the right to know. You always stay calm and collected and you don't ever get upset about anything, do you? Come on now. You can look on your screen and tell me it's not like I'm going to go national with it. I don't even know Piers Morgan. It's not like I'm going to get on TV and tattle on you. What happened at my house? I'm sorry, we're 
not uh, able to give you that information. I said, ma'am, I have three small children, and I travel a lot. I need to know what's happening at my neighbor's house. She said, it's not anything you need to worry about, sir. Oh. The skin on my fingers started crawling back and forth, running back and forth. My skin just started crawling, you know. If I've ever wanted to, and if, I, if my phone hadn't cost so much, I probably would have thrown it out the window. She just, that really bothered me, that she had the nerve to tell me I didn't need to worry about it. So I asked another friend of mine, and I live in a rural community, just like this is. We're not in no big city. And uh, I asked a buddy, another friend of mine in the police force, I said, you know, it, it was five police cruisers, and I just really w wish I knew what happened. He looked at me, and he said, what night of the week was it? And I told him, he said, he said, there's nothing going on during those nights. And usually if there's a call, everybody responds to it. Well, the woman could have told me that. The woman could have told me they were bored and decided to go all respond to whatever the call was, beating his dog or whatever it was. I don't know. Regardless of what it was, I listen very closely. Regardless of what it was, man, I'm telling you what, that made me nervous. That situation made me very, very, very nervous. And we've all, we've all seen problems and we've all seen instances where we don't know what to do. But the Bible does give us a cure. And we all do have a responsibility. In that situation, there was nothing I could do. I could do nothing about those uh, cruisers in my neighbor's driveway. I'm not a police officer. There's nothing I could do. But when it comes to the world's problem and people dying and going to hell, we all have been given something to do. There's three categories, and I'll close with these three categories. And these are mentioned in this story. I want you to get a hold of this. The first category is the 12 disciples. Those men followed Jesus everywhere. And when Jesus gave instructions on how to reach the world, he gave all of them instructions. Okay, they were all standing there when Jesus said, Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They were all standing there when Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. They were all standing there. The hundreds were standing there on the mountain when Jesus told them to receive power and to be witnesses. They were all there. It was a general command. We all have that. But then there were three out of those 12 disciples that got a little better status than the other 12. Now, I don't exactly know why, but who were the three that got to do a little more than the other nine? There were three of them, remember? They were at the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. They went into the house of Jairus when Jairus' 12-year-old daughter died. They were in there with her. They got to go in there. They were also with Jesus when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. They went a little further than the rest of them did. Who were they? Peter, James, and John. I don't know why they had a different status than the rest of them did. I'm not exactly sure. But I do know that they were a little bit better than the other nine. Or maybe not better is not the word I'm looking for. They were a little bit more faithful than the other nine. Closer, that's a good way to say it. They were closer than the other nine. But in this story, we find one that went further than anybody on planet earth to be with Jesus. John. Not Peter. What did Peter? Oh man, Peter turned the world upside down. Thousands were saved by the preaching of Peter. But John? What happened to John? John was by the cross of Calvary and Jesus breathing his last breaths and bleeding out and he was just in a terrible situation. I know he couldn't be very loud and John was very close by. And Jesus said, Behold thy son and behold thy mother. John got specific instructions on how to do his part in God's command to reach the world of the gospel. Now, we saw 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I mean, this world's falling apart. But God's got something specific for every one of us to do. Now, we can all take the general command, and most of us do that. Going all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. We just find our niche and do it. I mean, we can we can give money to help those that are going. We can pray for those that are going, or we can get in a bus or a boat or a plane and go ourselves. We can go ourselves. We find something to do. But did you know that if you draw close enough to God, Galatians two twenty said, "I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live; yet not I, but Christ liveth in me." There's a place at the cross. 
even though Jesus is no longer on the cross, even though this is we're speaking spiritually and maybe even metaphorically, there is a place at the cross for you to draw nigh to God and say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Well, I can do what everybody's doing. Everybody's got a job to do. But when John was there to the very end, I wonder if Peter, James, and John had been there. I wonder if God, Jesus would have given all three of them something to do. What if all the 11 saved Judas because he had just ruined his life? What if the other 11 had all been there? I can imagine Jesus being the CEO of Disciples International would have been hanging on the cross and said, Okay, Andrew, you got to do this. Uh, Simon, go do this. Uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, you go do this. James, the son of Thunder, Zebedee, you go do this. Uh, John, you take care of mom. Um, Peter, you do this. Philip, you do this. Uh, Matthew, go do this. Bartholomew, go do this. Thomas, go do this. Thaddeus, you go over here and do this. He could have given them all instructions if they had been there. But the only one that got the instructions specifically on what to do with his life was the one that stayed faithful all the way to the end. God is looking for somebody to crawl up to the throne, the throne room of grace and say, Lord, what would you have for me and my wife to do? What would you have for me and my husband to do? What would you have for our family to do? What would you have for me to do in my life? And if you're looking for somebody to marry, you crawl up to God and ask him. If you're looking for some, uh, some job, crawl up to God and ask him. If you're looking for a place to go, a place to move, crawl up to God and ask him. And he'll tell you. He'll use his word to speak to your heart. And every now and then he'll speak directly to you through his still small voice. Directly. I can imagine, I'll close with this. I can imagine John sitting there in the house with his, his new mom, Mary, his new mom, his, maybe his second mom, or now she's the first mom. They're in the house with her, and the brothers of Jesus, maybe they had got, you know, they're, they're not doing anything to help. So John's in there in the house with, with Mary, and it's breakfast time, and so he prepares breakfast for her. Maybe she's sick or maybe she's down. He's just taking care of her. I can imagine maybe a little boy running up. This is all in my head. This, ain't, this, is not, this is all in my head, okay? I can see a little boy, maybe my son's age or a little older, running up to the house and knocking on John's door. Mr. John. John says, come on in, son. And the boy goes in and said, did you hear what happened last night? Brother Peter, he preached and thousands were added to the church. Oh, I wish they could have heard you preach, John. You're a great preacher too. What was going on? Oh, you don't understand. Jesus told me to do this, and I'm going to do it. Some historians say that even John, John, what happened after John took Mary to his own home? He stayed there with her for a period of time. Then where did he go? He went to pastor the church at Ephesus. John pastored the church at Ephesus. In Ephesus is where John was arrested for preaching the gospel in Ephesus. They arrested him, threw him into prison, tried to boil him in oil, and it didn't kill him. Wow. Wonder why? Because he stayed with Jesus all the way to the end. There's something special about John. They tried to boil him in oil, and it didn't kill him. Then what they do to him? They dragged him out to the Isle of Patmos and left him. Oh, he died in loneliness and depression and discouragement. Oh, no. Oh, what did John do in the Isle of Patmos? Oh, he got to see the future. He got to pin down the words of probably the most important book for the last days. Where we can see what's fixing to happen to our world in the book of Revelation. What did John do? Yeah, Peter was winning the world. They all went out and won the world. What did John get to do? Well, the first book that he wrote, the second book that he wrote, third book he wrote, fourth, he wrote five books of the Bible. How important are they? The Gospel of John. Which book in your Bible has been used more around the world to get people into heaven? Now, I'm not belittling any book in the Bible, but I've never written a gospel track out of the book of Leviticus. I'm not belittling any part of the Bible, but there's something special about John 3.16. 
I'll just ask you this. Is there anybody in this room here today that God used the book of John somehow to help you get saved? Anybody in the room, maybe you heard a message, maybe, or maybe even you've talked to somebody using the book of John. Maybe you've quoted John 3.16. Yeah, you're, you're nodding at me. What is one of the first verses that you teach your children? John 3.16. Oh, but John, he had to stay home with the mother. God was punishing him. He must have done something wrong. Oh, no, God was letting him relax for a little while. Because he was going to be boiled in oil and exiled all alone to the Isle of Patmos. Where he was going to see things that nobody... He saw things that he couldn't even write down. Yeah. Whatever God's got for you, it's big. If John, the book of John, the gospel of John has got more people into heaven or been used to get more people into heaven than any other book. Which book of the Bible has been used to make sure people have assurance to know they're going? If you doubt your salvation, which book do you need to go read? First John. I mean, it's list after list of how you know you've got the love of God in you. If you're doubting your salvation today, John, man, he, he can help you. Oh, I know he's just at home taking care of the mother of Jesus, but John can help you. <laughs> yeah, come on now. And which book of the Bible has been used widely all over the world to show us what's fixing to happen? Who wrote the book of Revelation? John. It didn't seem like much at the time. God gave John something to do. And it took him three years to find the answer. God gave him something to do. He stayed faithful. And at the very end, the whispering words of the Lamb of God hanging on Calvary's cross was the pure instructions for John the beloved disciple to go out and do something for Jesus. Want direction in your life, guidance in your life? Crawl up to the foot of the cross and listen to the words of Jesus. He may let you stay or he may tell you to go. Whatever it is, it'll be right. Amen? Father, we're so thankful for the privilege to be in the house of God today. Help us to listen to you. Help us to get everything out of our lives that would keep us from hearing the whispering words of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. Help us to be obedient and do exactly what you say. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, sir.